welcome to this bonus episode of Unpo's British Science Week podcasts, and thanks for making it this far. Today we've got a real treat as Jamie talks to the astrophysicist that started Unplow many years ago. It's a long one, but we hope you enjoy it. So for British Science Week, we're chatting to a whole host of physicists and mathematicians. In this episode, we're talking to Josh Hayes. So Josh, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name's Josh, um, as Jamie has said. Uh, I am a PhD student at the Jobrel Bank Centre for Astrophysics. So I work looking at exoplanets. So these are planets that go around stars that aren't the sun. Um, so this could be something like Earth, or it could be something bigger, like Jupiter. Um, and what my job is, is to try and work out what their atmospheres are made out of. So here on Earth, we have an atmosphere full of oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Um, if you look at Jupiter, you start seeing uh, chemicals like ammonia. Um, and what we can do from all of this is we can work out what is in that atmosphere. Um, if the planet is rocky, we could potentially start looking for things like oxygen as indicators that there might be some sort of extraterrestrial organic stuff going on. I don't quite want to say aliens, but um, we could look for, say, microbial life. Um, and also just some generally really cool things. Um, so, yeah, um, I, that's pretty much where I am uh, and what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I'm also generally very proud to say that um, I helped or I founded uh, UMPO, uh, the University of Manchester Physics Outreach, who are doing this. Um, and quite frankly, I am so proud of everything that they have all done. Um, so I'm really quite honoured to be asked to do this. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. So we'll start with um, really kind of why physics and um, what kind of interested you in physics and what was your kind of path to where you are now? Um, so I, I am very fortunate, I think, in being able to have, well, in being able to say that I have had a sort of almost story-like arc to me doing physics. Um, so I, when I was in sixth form, I did a, um, an extended project qualification, EPQ, um, where I was looking at exoplanets. Um, and I thought, well, because at, at about the time, I think this was uh, just after the Kepler telescope had launched. Um, so sort of 2012-ish, I think. Um, and it was sort of big in the news and there was a news announcement of a planet called Kepler 22b, which was the first exoplanet uh, that had been found in what we call uh, the Goldilocks zone. Um, so this is the area, the, the space where, I, if you've got a planet going around a star, um, if you move it closer, it gets really hot. If you move it further away, it gets colder. There's a little sweet spot in the middle where the temperature is just right for liquid water to exist, hence Goldilocks zone. Um, and Kepler 22b was the first planet that had been found to be in that zone and also maybe be the right size to be rocky. Um, it's still uncertain to this day. We don't know if it, we don't really know very much about it. But um, yeah, this was sort of big in the news at the time. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a little bit of reading around this. Um, and then I ended up doing an extended project on it, um, sort of looking into the various uh, detection methods that were used to look at planets. And sort of, I got drawn in by the idea of um, extraterrestrial life, um, as I mean, any sci-fi reader among you will uh, will know that it's, it's, it's a really big thing. It's, it's, it's a really cool thing to think about. And I found the idea of being able to actually sort of look at it from a scientific point of view, um, fascinating. Um, there's this thing called the Drake equation, which is uh, basically a series of numbers that when you multiply them all together, you get an estimate of how many intelligent civilizations like ours there are in the galaxy. Um, and one of the, I, I think probably the first time that I ever started to delve into act, what I would call actual science, um, so the stuff you do at school is science, um, but it's ultimately stuff that's been repeated. Um, you're sort of retreading steps. And what I loved about being able to sort of play around with um, 
the Drake equation was I got to sort of start reading actual scientific papers and seeing what people were finding for these numbers that when you put them all together, you get a big number out. And so I thought I'd, you know, delve in, try and do my best. Um, and I think did some of the worst science I think I've ever done. Um, so I ended up, once I'd like pulled stuff off NASA and ESA, I ended up with an estimate of the number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy as somewhere between, I think it was 183 million and about four times 10 to the minus 43, um, which is an incredible range um, and basically boils down to the fact that um, we don't know very much. Um, we are very small uh, um, and that kind of genuinely blew my mind. Um, like that level of like the maths makes sense. I, I encourage you to go and have a look at the, the Drake equation if you want, but basically it's just a series of fractions. Um, so how many planets are there? How many of these do we expect to develop life? How much of that life then becomes intelligent? Um, but there's one number in there, uh, which is how long does a civilization last? We have no idea. Um, so depending on what estimates you use, you just end up in vastly different um vastly different regions of numbers um and that kind of made me go oh we don't actually know um all that much um it was it was the first time that i really kind of appreciated the fact that like the science the physics that you get taught at school is very well understood um and when you go from gcs when you do gcses you're like oh there's so much physics um but and and you sort of do a bit of it and then you might go on to a level um and suddenly you're doing three physics lessons a week and you're like oh okay there's more of it and then i ended up going on to degree where i was like okay i'm doing nine to five every day and there's still not enough time um and it's just that for me that first inkling of just how much i didn't know about this one thing was enough for me to say, actually, you know what, I wanna, I wanna learn more about that. And so I, I looked at sort of how do you get into astronomy? How do you become an astrophysicist? You do an astrophysics or a physics degree. That's, that's the primary way in. Um, so I turned up. Um, I actually, um, one of the things that surprised me about that was, um, I joined the University of Manchester in whatever, 2013, I wanna say. Um, and I originally joined on a physics with astrophysics degree um, because I was like, I like space, space is great. Um, and then I turned up and was like, actually, there's so much here I've never done. Um, so I stopped doing with astro and still did some astrophysics because you can but i sort of took that chance to to ex explore physics as a general big thing first and then um ended up sort of specializing towards the end of my degree uh did a master's project out at jodrell bank um and then decided to go for a phd um because it's something that i've always wanted to do um is research for me the point of a phd is i for me for me it's always been about leaving a mark um even if it's a p even if it's a scientific paper that is read by six people um in 50 years it may well be forgotten but at some point i've made a contribution to human knowledge and that for me was what i wanted to do with a phd um, but also I wanted to do it in something that interested me. So basically I applied to just exoplanets and ended up staying at Manchester working with Dr. Eamon Kerens, who has been a marvellous supervisor. Um, hi, Eamon, if you're listening. Um, and um, yeah, I've just sort of, I've had that opportunity to take what I was reading about at school and now I'm publishing papers on it. But like, it's, it's been such a wonderful journey for me um where i've i've had the opportunity to really make the sort of scientific world my home 
um, and sort of really get to understand it and give back to it as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's me in a rather large nutshell. But um, yeah. <laughs> so coming on to kind of um, doing a PhD, and the next question I kind of got is, what does a day in your life look like as an astrophysicist? Um, so I'm going to pretend that there's not a pandemic on when I answer this question. So normally I, so I try and treat my PhD like a job. And ultimately I think that's what it is. Um, I think for anyone who is thinking about going on to further study, um, be that a degree or a PhD, I think it's a really good practice to get into is to treat your study like a job um, because it helps you get in a really good frame of mind. I try and work nine to five or maybe 10 to six, depending on how tired I am in the morning. Um, what I tend to do is I'll get up, uh, I will make my way into work. I will sit down, make a cup of coffee um, and read my emails. Uh, and then subsequently realize that um, I've got a load of messages from people saying, can you fix this? Uh, my role at work uh, within my department is as a software developer, basically. So I am, I'm making software programs that people are using for science. Um, and the fun thing about science is that it's, it, it doesn't behave. Um, things that you, you might think that something is very simple and very easy to do. And then as soon as you put it out in the real world, it breaks. So I do a lot of fixing. Um, and I do a lot of thinking as well. Um, one of the things that I will often end up doing is uh, discussing things with my colleagues. Uh, so I work in a, an office of about 10 other PhD students um, and we're all in different fields. Um, so none of us are actually working directly with each other and that's actually kind of really nice. Um, there's an element of being able to explain your problem, um, your, like what you're trying to solve to someone who doesn't have that deep insight really helps. Um, so I'm, I'm not, uh, well, so I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I've been doing in the pandemic is um, trying to replace my, um, my office mates because I can't explain things to them. And so I currently have a small paw <laughs> Uh, sat next to me who I explain stuff to uh, in the hope that that helps me get my get my thoughts straight um, but yeah one uh, so either I'm sat on my desk I'm chatting to my office mates about these problems we'll be drawing things on whiteboards um, or I might be having sort of a more in-depth meeting with my supervisor or my uh, my group in which we sort of are discussing um, which telescopes we're going to be using, um, trying to choose planets to observe, um, which is a really cool thing to say now that I've said that out loud. Um, and then sort of looking at maybe the data that we've got and what that says um, and like whether or not do we do we believe these results? So a lot of science is about not just sort of blindly pressing numbers. It's looking at these numbers and saying, does this make sense um, or have I made a mistake somewhere? Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth on these. Uh, for instance, I, um, I got very worried slash um, excited um, a couple of weeks ago when I thought I had discovered a planet. Um, so I was doing some data analysis and I found a signal uh, in some time series data. Uh, so this was just, we were looking at planetary transits. So if you've got a star, you've got a planet that goes around it, that planet blocks out light. So what you see is a little bloop, 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 um, which sounds a bit like a, a radar um, if you're doing that, but you're expecting these to be regular. Um, and sometimes if they're irregular, um, sort of, and that follows like a little sine wave of um, how it changes, that's a sign that there is another planet somewhere in that system. There's gravitational effects going on. And I saw a signal. I was like, cool, this is great. Um, and for the next two months, I was trying to work out exactly what was going on. Um, 
like how big would this planet have to be? Where would it have to be within the system? What's the geometry of this? And then someone pointed out to me that the periodicity, so the, the period of the planetary sea or the this signal I was seeing was about 400 days, but with a fairly large uncertainty on that. So we were so basically we we could say that it was somewhere between about 340 days to about 420 days. Um, unfortunately for me, we aren't stationary in space. Um, the Earth goes around the sun. Um, and if you're making measurements from the Earth, you have to account for that. So what we often do is rather than using the time that we see something at Earth, we will correct to basically the center of the solar system. So that never moves. Um, and what I had failed to realize was that I hadn't made that correction. So what I was actually seeing was, um, basically I'd discovered that the sun goes, that the earth goes around the sun. Um, and I'd spent two months uh, trawling through data to find out that, oh, uh, <laughs> we, heliocentrism is a thing, great. And kind of, it would be really easy to be like, oh no, flip table storm out. But actually, I was really pleased with that because it meant that my code was working. Um, because I'd, I'd made a mistake somewhere else, but it wasn't actually, like I'd made a mistake earlier on, but everything worked. Um, that mistake was found. Um, and, and I think for me, that's kind of the really fun thing about science is that you can make mistakes and stuff can still come out of it. I mean, like classic example is penicillin. Um, Alexander um, Fleming, is it Alexander Fleming? Yes. Yeah. Um, Alexander Fleming left a Petri dish out and then went on holiday, came back and found that there was a little bit of mold that nothing else would touch. Um, and he sort of was like, okay, this seems to be killing all of the other microbes and had a look at it. That was penicillin. Uh, we have one of the best antibiotics available to us just because some guy didn't do his washing up before he went on holiday. Um, and it's that kind of, that, that kind of, the fact that science is alive um, and it's science is done by people. Um, it's things are made, discoveries are made by people. Um, and it's, it's that side of it that I think makes it interesting. Um, it's not this, uh, it, it's, it's not the stuffy room with personality list people um, sat around computers typing and one of them going, Eureka! That's not how it happens. People make mistakes and stuff comes out of it. And like, that's kind of, that is just fun, frankly. Um, yeah. Um, I forgot what the original question was at this point. I've just, oh, yeah, I, no, I'm that's just, a, okay. Uh, what's a day in the life like that had to And my next question was yeah. going to be, what does your research focus on and what are you currently working on? Which I suppose has kind of been covered there. If there's anything else as well, you also sort of wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I, so, Right now, uh, so I am coming up to the end of my PhD, uh, which is when uh, we have to write a thing known as a thesis, which is basically, if any of you listening are at school, uh, you might have been asked to write something that is, I don't know, maybe a 1500 word um, essay, and you've gone, ah, oh, no. Um, most theses are about 200 pages long. Um, so this is basically, I'm, I'm writing a, a, a book um, that is about everything I've done in the last three and a half years, four years. Um, so I've got, I've got to put that together, um, but the thing is I've also got to find the stuff to put in it. Um, PhDs are, like I said about science being alive, um, progress can be notoriously fickle um and sometimes you'll be like i've got this great idea it should only take three weeks and then a year later you're still going um so i'm 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 now at that point of i'm trying to balance everything i want to do with the amount of time that i have um and unfortunately these two things won't talk to each other and uh so yeah i mean right now i'm trying to finish up 
some uh, projects uh, so that I can sort of write these things up. Um, I'm also trying to work out what I want to do afterwards, but that is let's 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 leave that one for now. Um, and yeah, oh, that was brilliant. So I've got a kind of fun question for the next one. Um, okay. So it's, what's your favourite object in space? And this can be a man-made object, or it can be a kind of um, object that was already there in space. Um, and also, why is that your favourite of those objects? I think, I, so it's, it's not one particular object. It's a, it's a type of planet. Um, so, I mean, yes, I'm going to be very unimaginative, but like I've already said, I've loved planets from since I was 16 or something, and I'm now, like, that, I'm now a decade on. Um, so there's, so on Earth, we have the water cycle, right? So water evaporates, forms, condenses, forms clouds, rains, rains down again. Um, that's great. It keeps us hydrated. It means we can live. Um, like I was saying about where you place your planet in relation to the, if it's host star, that affects how hot the planet is. Um, and if you move your planet very, very close to your host star, it gets very, 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 very hot. Um, so hot that basically all the water leaves, goes off into space, never comes back. And instead of a water cycle, you might have um, an iron cycle. So you can have um, planets where instead of water evaporating, so we're, we're talking sort of Jupiter-like planets. There's no surface here. It's all going on within the atmosphere. But you might have um, iron heating up, evaporating to the upper atmosphere, condensing, and then raining molten liquid, uh, molten liquid metal uh, back down, where it then heats up again, evaporates. There's um, there's a, there's a, there's even an example, and I cannot remember the name of the planet uh, right now uh, because planet names are notoriously annoying to remember. It's HD some telephone number, but um, there's one that is even hotter than that. Um, and it's so hot that rather than an iron cycle, it has a silicon cycle. So um, if you want to make glass, what you do is melt sand. Sand is made of silicon. Um, and so what you actually end up with in, on this planet is clouds which rain molten glass. Um, there's an extra thing here where because of how hot, close the planet is to the star, one side of its atmosphere is so much hotter than the other. Um, and this is what drives wind. So winds on the planet are on Earth, for instance, are driven by uh, the fact that there's different temperatures. So um, those of you who are doing physics, um, you might have called physics or chemistry you might have come across the ideal gas equation pv equals nrt so pv um our pressure and our volume our volume stays the same if we raise the temperature we increase our pressure um so if somewhere has a lower temperature has a lower pressure and wind moves from high pressure to low pressure if you get a planet and move it very very close to a star the temperature difference is enormous so you end up with winds that basically mean your molten glass rain is but is moving horizontally so it's just moving completely across you so if you were to somehow be stood there you would just be torn apart by molten glass um i think that's my favorite planet because it's just so awesome i'm just saying if, if raining molten iron wasn't terrifying enough i think that's, <laughs> i said that's i i hadn't heard of those before and i you know, yeah i can't even imagine what being on one of these plants would be like it's yeah you probably don't really want to um I'm so, <laughs> i mean th this this is one of the i think this is kind of the saddest point about what i work on is that we'll never go there at least not in my lifetime or in the lifetime of the grandchildren of anyone listening to this um like uh, space is enormous like so big um and like it, if we I worked this out once where so the fastest thing that people have ever sent up into space is um, the Voyager spacecraft. So that's uh, Voyager 2, I think, went out past um, 
past Pluto a few years back. Uh, or that well, there's New Horizons as well. Um, but if you these are the, the these things are pretty fast. Um, they've got to the edge of the solar system in about 30, 40 years. That's speedy. Um, if you were on one of those and heading towards the nearest planet, uh, Proxima Centauri B, um, then that would take you about 44 million years to get to. Um, and that's the nearest one. Um, like most of the rest of them, so things like Kepler, 40, Kepler 22b, which I was talking about earlier, that's several thousand light years away. So it takes light, the fastest thing in the universe, <laughs> several thousand years to get there. Um, and it's just I, like, to me, that's kind of tragic. Like we're, we're finding all this beauty that we're never going to actually be able to see and we're never going to be able to, able to visit. And ah, I don't know. It's kind of bittersweet, I think. So a few questions you'd mentioned about founding UMPO. Uh, so a few questions about those and about outreach as well. Um, so the first one is um, kind of what inspired you to found UMPO? Um, so the University, University of Manchester Physics Outreach was um, initially, well, so it was part of a summer programme that I was part of. Um, we had, I was working with um, my co-founder, Luke Simpson, um doing an outreach project with um the Ogden Science Officer at the University of Manchester, Emma Nichols. And um Emma basically we turned up on day one and Emma said, Right, here's a box of kit. Um I've been given this by a charity um on the condition that I speak to four thousand people using their stuff. Um I haven't started yet. Um we've got three months uh can can you help and that that was kind of that was that was what was put in front of me and i sort of i, I went through this box of stuff um and it was some pretty nifty little things like it was a lot of sort of lasers and polar polarizer filters and things and sort of very sort of hands-on things and i was kind of thinking right well i live in manchester where are the people um, it's summer, schools are closed, what are we going to do? And so we came up with the idea of um, doing what's known as science busking, um, which is just standing in the middle of a street with some stuff of, like science props and just trying to talk to people, um, which either, either goes down really well or people steer wide steer very clear of you um it's never never a happy medium of the two um but we ended up we did this um we we're like okay right well it's just the two of us we're gonna need more people here and basically sent out an email saying does anyone want to do this and then got about i don't know 15 emails replying within a day and we thought there's there's a lot of enthusiasm for this um like people want to share what they're doing like i mean every everyone at, everyone at university is there because they want to do this subject they have a passion for it um and the the only way that you can really get people to continue having a passion in it is if people who love the subject go and talk to them um and so we thought actually maybe we we is, is there do we want something more than this um and so we sort of we started playing around with like more science busking opportunities and then started talking to various schools and things seeing like does anyone want to have some slightly over enthusiastic physics students come along and shout about space or whatever um and there was just like a, I, I was genuinely taken aback by how a how happy schools were by it. I didn't realize how much some schools struggled for resources. Um, and when I'm and my student fellow students are in a position to give back to the communities that have helped us get to where we are, a lot of us just went, yes, absolutely, we'll do it. Um, but then also, I was genuinely taken aback by the student response and how people like yourself, Jamie, have just taken this on. Like I, Jamie and I, we, we've never worked together. And like, there's, 
when I when I left Umpo, it was in the hands of people that I knew I'd worked with. And it's the fact that we're now like three or four generations down the line. And frankly, I would never have dreamed of doing this. Um, like this, this sort of trying to do a series of podcasts that you're going to put on Spotify or YouTube or wherever, that's such a, like, that's such a big step on from standing in Manchester town centre shouting science at anyone that comes near you. That, like, that, the, the fact that students have taken this and, like, uh, people have, have been so enthusiastic to share um, what they care about is, like, it, it, it's amazing. Um, but the... Yeah, um, I mean that that's sort of where we ended up with with Umpo. Um, we I, we ended up uh, doing doing things with uh, the Blue Dot um, Festival uh, when I was in fourth year. That was when that was sort of kicking off. But um, yeah, I've ju- it's it's just enjoyable to talk about science in places to people who aren't expecting it. Um, but like that's kind of there's the flip side of that there's there's people who aren't expecting it because they're just out and about um and there's people who aren't expecting it because they've never had it um and that for me was sort of the real um like the fundamental reason why science outreach is important um i am incredibly fortunate from my background um i went to a school where we had resources we had people who would encourage me like we had people coming back old we had old members of the school of the school coming back from university to talk about stuff um not everyone has that um and i think that that's not fair um and i i i think that there is something that can be done uh, by both individuals and at a, a higher level i am an individual i am not the government and so what I want to do is be able to go around and talk to anyone who has never met a scientist. Um, I want to show any child out there or any, anyone, frankly, who has an interest in science, who doesn't think that they can be a scientist because they've never met one, they've never seen people like themselves um, in science. I want to tell them that they're wrong um, and that there is a place for them in science. Um, there is a place for them in research and it doesn't matter. Um, well, it shouldn't matter who you are um, and where you've come from. All that should matter is that you care about it and that you're interested in it. And I think there's a there's something to be said for younger members of the scientific community taking it on um taking that on as a stand um because don't get me wrong um there are a lot of very very proactive inclusive uh, more senior members of staff um and more senior scientists but a lot of the issues are with being disconnected um undergrads especially have just come from that back they they've, a lot of them might have come from that background um and so the ability to actually empathize um and talk about um these things when you were only a couple of years older or whatever um that i think has the opportunity to to be really impactful um and i i think it's important that we recognize as um as as science communicators that um there there is a there's a there's a surprising amount of power um and responsibility that comes with that to quote spider-man i said i was going to ask why is physics outreach so important but i think you kind of (laughs) nailed it on the head there about you know giving back and and connecting Hmm. with people who you know wouldn't have the opportunity um so the last question that I've got before we kind of round off is what would you recommend to anyone, kids or adults, who are keen to pursue a, a career in physics? Um, read, watch. Work, work, obviously, 
do do your homework do like pay attention in lessons but i i think what makes a good scientist is more than being able to do maths um or it's more than remembering equations um quite frankly i had to look up the volume of a sphere the other day um like i th these are not things that i hold in my head um what makes a good scientist is someone who questions um someone who looks for extra information so find a good science book um i would really recommend um sort of uh, a level um sort of level um there's a book called how to teach quantum physics your dog by chad all um fantastic book really well written um and really really good at explaining sort of fundamental quantum concepts um from the perspective of can you get a dog to go in two places at once around a tree um there's books like that like have something that you're reading but like that it doesn't have to be like a, a a proper book um you don't have to go out and buy university physics textbook and read that cover to cover that's a resource that's just that that's ultimately just a list of equations um and a list of equations is not a thing that that's not what makes a good scientist not what makes a good physicist um you're far better off i would say provided you're doing the work at school emphasis on that um but i i would say you're far better off watching a load of documentaries um like I mean, go and watch Brian Cox's latest thing. Go and watch, like I, my, when I am ill, my default watch is I put Planet Earth on, um, the David Attenborough documentary. I just put Planet Earth on and lie on the sofa for two days. That is my recovery process. Um, because I find, I just find it interesting and cool to be connected to the world around me. I don't need to like look at these antelope and completely understand what's going on with their legs. I don't care. They're just nice. They're neat. Um, but like that's that's the attitude that you want to try and get. Like looking at the world around you and saying, hey, that's neat. Um, how does that work? Um, and asking that question is far, far better for you than just like memorizing a bunch of equations because you are not a computer. Um, as I said earlier, science is done by people um, and people have different experiences with different backgrounds. Um, and sometimes your different experiences mean that you view something differently. Um, and if you approach a problem from your background, using yourself as a person, you might find an answer that no one else has come across. You might ask a question that no one else has thought of. Um, and that's within your power um and that that's something that literally anyone can do like anyone can ask a question um not everyone can necessarily find the answer but sometimes it's enough within science to just pose that question and have everyone else go hmm and i i yeah just the the community aspect of science is something that is is built around everyone um or at least should be um so yeah like if, if you want to become part of the science community i would say that it's important that you understand what it is to be a member of that community um and uh, what it is is to be a person who asks questions um and who doesn't just say oh, i don't know but also does say it um one of the most powerful things that you can say is i don't know um but the difference between a good scientist and a bad scientist is when you say i don't know um a good scientist will say but here's how i might find out um and i think that for me is sort of if someone says that then yeah they're they're gonna they're gonna do well well, that's that's really brilliant. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you for letting us interview you for British Science Week. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been wonderful to talk to you and see what Ampo are doing. 
thanks so much for joining us throughout British Science Week. That was the last of our interviews and we hope you've enjoyed listening to them as much as we enjoyed making them and that you've been inspired to get into physics yourselves. It's never too late to spread the word. We are at UOM Phys Outreach on social media and from all of the team, we hope to see you soon. Thank you.